Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips. Um, first of all, we'll start with some announcements. Um, psychiatric drug withdrawal. How, why and how to withdraw from psychiatric drugs starts um, October 3rd. That's coming soon. And uh, this is a marvelous course that was designed by Dr. Peter Bregan with us um, to help with this very important issue. You know, 25% of the people in the United States are taking the drugs. And uh, you can go to my Facebook page and uh, watch a video I just did, a Facebook Live video. Never did that before, so that was a fun experience. But um, that video has more information, and you can send me an email, pampopper at msn.com. I'm happy to send you a course catalog. But we have to do something about this. 25% of the country is medicated. There is no such thing as a chemical imbalance in the brain that causes any of these psychological disorders for which the drugs are used. People are good at prescribing them. Doctors and nurses and nurse practitioners are prescribing them, but they really don't know much about how to de-prescribe them. And uh, it's a tricky thing because they're highly addictive. It's worse than discontinuing um, uh, street drugs like heroin, for example. So that's coming up. Tonight starts my class, Plant-Based Nutrition and Health. Um, you'd have to hurry, but you can still join us. This is a good basic class if you've been out of academia for a while to get yourself back in gear. Uh, it's part of the Nutrition Educator Program. And then uh, conference is uh, coming. It's only a couple months away. And we have some amazing speakers. So go to our website at wellnessfarmhealth.com. There's a little section at the top. It says, what's new? And what you can do is um, click on, on the what's new section. There's a part that says uh, conference and, and there's tons of information. The flyers are posted there with a description of all the speakers. There's a live interview with Dr. Peter Bregan. There are some interviews between Dr. Bregan and Dr. Gercha, who's coming here from Denmark, co-founder of Cochrane Collaboration. And uh, I think if you look at all that stuff, you're really, really, really gonna wanna spend that weekend in November in Columbus, Ohio with us. All right, um, let's talk about the latest in research, and there's always something interesting to talk about. It seems that there is finally some sanity coming from some health professionals regarding the results of the SPRINT trial, which I've talked about and written about quite a bit. It was supposedly a landmark, I would put air quotes around it, study showing the benefits of lowering systolic blood pressure to 120 or lower, using as many drugs as you need to to get to that target. And some of the people in the trial were taking four or more drugs to do it. A new analysis uh, presented at the European Society of Cardiology uh, 2017 shows that for patients with systolic pressure of 160 or above who otherwise have low risk factors for cardiovascular events, medicating to a target of 140 might be better than the previously set target of 120. For this subset of patients, aggressive treatment provided no benefit but did result in a threefold increase in the um, risk of all-cause mortality. Sprint researcher Dr. Tsung Dao Wang, and I probably butchered that name, said, quote, although these results need further verification, it's worth considering that a universal target of 120 might not be best for everyone. In fact, it not, may not be best for anyone at all. According to some, the SPRINT data showed that for most hypertensive patients, benefits outweighed risks, but those benefits were so small. While the presenters at the conference continued to refer to this relative risk reduction of like 25%, um, and that's how they described the people who quote unquote benefited, analysis of the data showed that the real risk reduction in absolute terms was slightly greater than 1% reduction in deaths, slightly less than 1% lower incidence of heart failure, and about one half of 1% decrease in events overall. In return for what I think are underwhelming results, 5% of the intervention patients had serious complications, which include blood pressure so low, it caused severe dizziness or fainting, electrolyte imbalances, and damage to the kidneys. The incidence of serious complications in the control group was 2.5%, which means those taking the additional drugs had double the risk. Further caution at this conference in Europe was expressed by Dr. Macklem Graham, care of the uh, chair of the Joint European Societies for Cardiovascular Prevention Committee. He said, quote, 
None of the other large trials of aggressive blood pressure lowering have shown such a big benefit of reducing blood pressure to below 120. I don't think people are quite convinced of the more aggressive targets for blood pressure suggested by the sprint main results yet. I think they will need to be replicated before they become routine clinical practice. My fear is that the enthusiasm that I have watched that, that the sprint has generated is that this is already starting to become routine practice and in fact that's what the history of medicine has been about is jumping off the cliff when, new some, when something new comes out and then finding out later on, bad idea after it's already become a standard practice. In fact, many studies call into question the recommendations in response to uh, the SPRINT trial. According to a Cochrane review, uh, reducing blood pressure to below 140 over 90 with medication increases the risk of heart attack, strokes, and death. And the Cochrane group concluded, quote, treating patients to lower than standard blood pressure targets, which they define as between 140 to 160 over 90 to 100, does not reduce mortality or morbidity. So I, here's where I am on this issue. First of all, I, I think we should not be using the SPRINT trial for anything other than to talk about on YouTube because nobody should be using this as a guideline for treating patients. But I guess here's my real concern. Research dollars are scarce. There's never enough to go around, and I can think of a million things we could invest research dollars in that we're not doing anything about right now. Why do we continue to waste money trying to find more excuses for prescribing more medication when this almost always turns out to be a bad idea? It's a great idea for the drug companies. It's a great idea to, because it drums up business for cardiologists, but it's a terrible idea for the patient. And while we're on the, on the topic of terrible ideas for patients, um, let's talk about calcium. In spite of overwhelming and consistent evidence showing that calcium supplements are harmful, they lead to increased risk of both heart attack and stroke, and useless by the way, health professionals continue to advise people to take them to quote, build strong bones. All of this calcium is needed, people are told, because it increases bone mineral density and this protects against fractures. The problem is that it's not true. In the case of calcium, not only does increased calcium not lead to stronger bones, it leads to increased risk of fracture, the very thing that taking the increased calcium is supposed to prevent. The reason is that there's a great deal of confusion about the fact that bone mineral density is often confused with bone strength and they are not the same thing. Calcium pills will increase bone mineral density but they don't build stronger bones, and that's why you have an increased fracture risk. So when you load up on calcium pills and calcium fortified foods and that sort of thing, you end up with good DEXA scans, but not such good bone health, and that's exactly the point. We should be focusing on bone health. There's another issue with calcium pills, and this is very concerning. That is the connection, it's a correlation, between high bone mineral density and increased risk of breast cancer. I was shocked when I started looking into this. Several studies have identified this correlation, with some studies showing a relationship between higher bone mineral density and invasive breast cancer. The effect appears to be dose dependent. As bone mineral density increases, so does cancer risk. Women in the highest tertile of bone mineral density have an almost two and a half times greater risk of advanced breast cancer as compared to women in the lowest tertile of bone mineral density. Now, at this point in time, to be fair, no specific mechanism of action has been identified that explains this relationship. And it's certainly not clear that taking calcium pills increases the risk. We just have, we have this observation, but here's my point. A strong case can be made for avoiding calcium pills due to the increased risk of heart attack and stroke, due to the increased risk of fracture. Um, we certainly don't want to increase the risk of anything else. And so a couple of issues, I, I think the first thing is, and I've always said this, the supplements you have to be really careful of are the ones that quote unquote work. Because if they have an effect in one place, they're gonna have another effect someplace else. We call that a side effect when you're talking about drugs. Well, supplements can have side effects too. And in many instances, we don't know what those are because supplements are not well studied. Now, I buy the whole thing. I totally understand when people say, well, you can't patent a calcium pill, and that's why the research can't be done. But it doesn't change what I'm talking about here, which is humans becoming experimental guinea pigs to find out what happens when you start loading up on calcium pills, for example, and it seems like we keep finding out that it's not necessarily good stuff that comes out of that. 
The other thing that I want to point out, and I know many of you who've watched me for a long time have heard me say this, is this continuing thought that in the nutrition business, more is better. In other words, if there's if a little bit of calcium is good for you, a four or five hundred milligrams a day helps you build strong bones, my gosh, it's got to be better to consume four times that much. And, and that's not the case. There are consequences of consuming large amounts of any nutrient by itself because nutrients, the human body is used to processing nutrients and extracting them uh, from food in combination with other nutrients. So the bottom line is that more is not better. Calcium pills are not the way to build strong bones. I've put out many articles about this, published many articles about um, the best way to build uh, strong bones is exercise, sunlight, a good working gastrointestinal tract, and eating a health-promoting plant-based diet like the one that we promote here at Wellness Forum Health. All right, that's all for today. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think would enjoy watching it, and I'll be back to you on Thursday with more news.